The Battle of Karbala took place on Moharram 10, in the year 61 of the Islamic calendar, October 10, 680, in Karbala, in present-day Iraq. On one side of the highly uneven battle were a small group of supporters and relatives of Muhammad's grandson, Hussein ibn Ali. And on the other was a large military detachment from the forces of Yazid, the Umayyad Caliph. Political Background The Rule of the Third Caliph Uthman ibn Affan Concluded with a violent uprising This uprising ended with the assassination of Uthman and for many days rebels seized and occupied the city of Medina. Under the overwhelming pressure of the Ummah, Ali ibn Abu Talib was elected as the fourth caliph with massive numbers of people swearing their allegiance to him. His immediate steps were to ensure the unity of Muslims. The governor of Sham, Moawiyah, kinsman to the murdered caliph Uthman, refused allegiance to Ali and revolted against him using his cousin's unpunished murder as a pretext. This resulted in armed confrontations between the Islamic Caliph, Ali ibn Abu Talib, and Moawiyah. Practically, the Muslim world became divided. At the death of Ali ibn Abu Talib, his elder son Hazan ibn Ali succeeded him but soon signed a treaty with Moawiyah to avoid further bloodshed. Moawiyah remained the ruler of Sham. Prior to his death, Moawiyah was actively plotting a major deviation from Islamic norms. He was establishing his son Yazid, as the next ruler, hence establishing dynastic rule for the first time in Islam. This was a move which was considered unacceptable by some leaders of the Ummah, including the younger son of Ali ibn Abu Talib. Hussein ibn Ali believed the appointment of Yazid as the heir of the Caliphate would lead to hereditary kingship which was against the original political teachings of Islam. Therefore, he resolved to confront Yazid. Yazid instructed his governor Walid in Medina to force Hussein ibn Ali to pledge allegiance to Yazid. Hussein refused it, and uttered his famous words that, anyone akin to me, will never accept anyone akin to Yazid as a ruler. Hussein departed Medina on Rajab 28, 60 a.h. 680 CE, two days after Walid's attempt to force him to submit to Yazidi's rule. It is mainly during his stay in Mecca, that he received many letters from Kofa, assuring him their support and asking him to come over there and guide them. He answered their calls and sent Muslim ibn Aqil, his cousin, to Kofa, as his representative in an attempt to consider the exact situation and public opinion. Hussein's representative to Kofa, Muslim ibn Aqil was welcomed by the people of Kofa, and most of them swore allegiance to him. After this initial observation, Muslim ibn Aqil wrote to Hussein ibn Ali that the situation in Kofa was favorable. However, after the arrival of the new governor of Kofa, Abayd Allah ibn Ziyad, the scenario changed. Muslim ibn Aqil and his host, Hani ibn Awar, were executed on. Tho al hijjah 960, A.H., September 10, 680 C.E., without any considerable resistance of the people. This shifted the loyalties of the people of Kofa, in favor of Yazid against Hussein ibn Ali. Hussein ibn Ali also realized a deep conspiracy that Yazid had appointed Omar ibn Sa'd, as the head of an army, ordering him to take charge of the pilgrimage caravans and to kill Al Hussein ibn Ali wherever he could find him during Hajj, and hence decided to leave Mecca on 8th, though Al Hajj 60 a.h., 12th of September 680 c.e., just a day before Hajj and was contented with Umrah, due to his concern about potential violation of the sanctity of the Kaaba. He delivered a famous sermon in Kaaba highlighting his reasons to leave, that he didn't want the sanctity of Kaaba to be violated, since his opponents had crossed any norm of decency, and were willing to violate all tenets of Islam. He gave a speech to people the day before his departure and said, The death is a certainty for mankind, just like the trace of necklace on the neck of young girls. And I am enamored of my ancestors like eagerness of Jacob to Joseph. Everyone, who is going to devote his blood for our sake and is prepared to meet Allah, must depart with us. 
Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad, appointed Omar ibn Sa'd to command the battle against Hussein ibn Ali. At first Omar ibn Sa'd rejected the leadership of the army but accepted after Ibn Ziyad threatened to take away the governorship of Ray City, and put Shimr ibn Ziljoshan in his place. Omar ibn Sa'd moved towards the battlefield with an 80,000 strong army and arrived at Karbala on Moharam 2, 61 AH, October 3, 680 CE. Ibn Ziyad sent a brief letter to Omar ibn Sa'd that commanded prevent Hussein and his followers from accessing water and do not allow them to drink a drop. Ibn Sa'd followed the orders, and 5,000 horsemen blockaded the river of al -Farat. One of Hussein's followers met Omar ibn Sa'd, and tried to negotiate some sort of access to water but was denied. Omar ibn Sa'd received an order from Ibn Ziyad to start the battle immediately, and not to postpone it further. The army started advancing toward Hussein's camp on the afternoon of Moharam 9th. At this point, Hussein sent Abbas ibn Ali to ask Ibn Sa'd to wait until the next morning, so that he and his men could spend the night praying. Ibn Sa'd agreed to the respite. On the night before the battle, Hussein gathered his men and told them that they were all free to leave the camp in the middle of the night, under cover of darkness, rather than face certain death if they stayed with him. None of Hussein's men defected and they all remained with him. Hussein and his followers held a vigil, and prayed all night. Start of the day of the battle. On Moharam 10th, also called Ashura, Hussein ibn Ali completed the morning prayers with his companions. He appointed Zohar ibn al Kain to command the right flank of his army, Habib ibn Mozahar, to command the left flank and his half-brother, Abbas ibn Ali as the standard bearer. Hussein ibn Ali's companions numbered 32 horsemen and 40 infantrymen. Hussein rode on his horse, Thu, al -Jana. Hussein ibn Ali called the people around him to join him for the sake of Allah, and to defend Muhammad's family. His speech affected al Hor ibn Yazid al-Rayahi, the commander of the Tamim and Hamdan tribes, who had stopped Hussein from his journey. He abandoned Omar ibn Sa'd and joined Hussein's small band of followers. On the other side, Yazid had sent Shima, his chief commander, to replace Omar ibn Sa'd as the commander. The battle starts. Omar ibn Sa'd advanced and fired an arrow at Hussein ibn Ali's army, saying, Give evidence before the governor that I was the first thrower. Ibn Sa'd's army started showering Hussein's army with arrows. Hardly any men from Hussein ibn Ali's army escaped from being shot by an arrow. Both sides began fighting. The first skirmish was between the right flank of Imam Hussein's army with the left of the Sham army. A couple of dozens men under the command of Zohar ibn Qain fought heroically and repulsed the initial infantry attack and in the process destroyed the left flank of the Sham army which in disarray collided with the middle of the army. Seeing this, the Sham army quickly retreated and broke the pre-war verbal agreement of not using arrows and lances. This agreement was made in view of the small number of Hussein ibn Ali's companions. Omar ibn Sa'd, on advice of Omar ibn al-Hajjaj, ordered his army not to come out for any duel, and to attack Hussein ibn Ali's army together. Omar ibn al-Hajjaj attacked Hussein ibn Ali's right wing, but the men were able to maintain their ground kneeling down as they planted their lances. They were thus able to frighten the enemy's horses. When the horsemen came back to charge at them again, Hussein's men met them with their arrows, killing some of them and wounding others. Omar ibn al-Hajjaj kept saying the following to his men, fight those who abandoned their creed, and who deserted the Gemma. Hearing him say so, Hussein ibn Ali said to him, Woe unto you, O Omar! Are you really instigating people to fight me? Are we really the ones who abandon their greed while you yourself uphold it? As soon as our souls part from our bodies, you will find out who is most worthy of entering the fire. In order to prevent random and indiscriminate showering of arrows on Hussein ibn Ali's camp, which had women and children in it, Hussein's followers went out to single combats. Men like Barayr ibn Qadir, Muslim ibn Azajar, 
and Habib ibn Mozahir, were slain in the fighting. They were attempting to save Hussein's life by shielding him. Every casualty had a considerable effect on their military strength, since they were vastly outnumbered by Yazid's army. Hussein's companions were coming, one by one, to say goodbye to him, even in the midst of battle. Almost all of Hussein's companions were killed, by the onslaught of arrows or lances. After almost all of Hussein's companions were killed, his relatives asked his permission to fight. The men of Banu Hashim, the clan of Muhammad and Ali, went out one by one. Ali al-Akbar ibn Hussein, the middle son of Hussein ibn Ali, was the first one of Hashemite who received permission from his father. Casualties from Banu Hashim were sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, sons of Hassan ibn Ali, a son of Hussein ibn Ali, a son of Abdullah ibn Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and Zainab bint Ali, sons of Akil ibn Abi Talib, as well as a son of Muslim ibn Akil. There were 72 Hashemites dead in all, including Hussein ibn Ali. Death of Abbas ibn Ali Al-Abbas ibn Ali advanced towards al Farat branch along a dike. Abbas ibn Ali continued his advance into the heart of Ibn Sa'd's army. He was under heavy shower of arrows, but was able to penetrate them and get to the branch leaving heavy casualties from the enemy. He immediately started filling the water skin, in a remarkable and immortal gesture of loyalty to his brother and Muhammad's grandson. He did not drink any water despite being severely thirsty. He put the water skin on his right shoulder and started riding back toward their tents. Omar ibn Sa'd ordered an outright assault on Abbas ibn Ali saying, that if Abbas ibn Ali succeeds in taking water back to his camp, we will not be able to defeat them till the end of time. A massive enemy army blocked his way and surrounded him. He was ambushed from behind a bush, and his right arm was cut off. Abbas ibn Ali put the water skin on his left shoulder and continued his way, but his left arm was also cut off. Abbas ibn Ali now held the water skin with his teeth. The army of Ibn Sa'd started shooting arrows at him. One arrow hit the water skin and water poured out of it. Now he turned his horse back towards the army and charged towards them. But one arrow hit his eyes, and someone hit a goes on his head, and he fell off the horse. In his last moments, when Abbas ibn Ali was wiping the blood in his eyes to enable him to see Hussein's face, Abbas ibn Ali said not to take his body back to the camps because he had promised to bring back water, but could not and so could not face Bibi Sokana, the daughter of Hussein ibn Ali. Then he called Imam Hussein, brother. For the first time in his life before the death of Abbas, Hussein ibn Ali said, Abbas, your death is like the breaking of my back. Death of Hussein ibn Ali Hussein ibn Ali told Yazid's army to offer him single battle, and they gave his request. He killed everybody that fought him in single battles. He frequently forced his enemy into retreat, killing a great number of opponents. Hussein and earlier his son Hazrat Ali Akbar were the two warriors who penetrated and dispersed the core of Ibn Sa'd's army, Kalbi Lashkar, a sign of extreme chaos in traditional warfare. Imam Hussein advanced very deep in the back ranks of the Sham army. When the enemies stood between him and the tents he shouted, Woe betide you O followers of Abu Sufyan's dynasty! If no religion has ever been accepted by you, and you have not been fearing the resurrection day, then be noble in your world, that's if you are Arabs as you claim. Then his enemies invaded back towards him. They continuously attacked each other. until his numerous injuries caused him to stay a moment. At this time he was hit on his forehead with a stone. He was cleaning blood from his face, while he was hit on the heart with arrow, and he said, In the name of Allah, and by Allah, and on the religion of the Messenger of Allah. Then he raised his head up and said, Oh my God! You know that they are killing a man, 
that there is son of daughter of a prophet on the earth except him. He then grasped and pulled the arrow out of his chest, which caused heavy bleeding. He became very weak and stopped fighting. The soldiers approaching him gave up confrontation, seeing his position. One soldier, however, walked up to Imam Hussein and hit him on his head with his sword. The enemies hesitated to fight Imam Hussein, but they decided to surround him. At this time Abdullah ibn Hazan, an underage boy, escaped from the tents and ran to Hussein. When a soldier intended to slay Hussein, Abdullah ibn Hazan defended his uncle with his arm, which was cut off. Imam Hussein hugged Abdullah, but the boy was already hit by an arrow. Imam Hussein got on his horse and tried to leave, but Yazid's army continued pursuit. According to tradition, a voice came from skies stating, We are satisfied with your deeds and sacrifices. Hussein then sheathed his sword and tried to get down from the horse but was tremendously injured and so the horse let him down. He then sat against a tree. Omar ibn Sa'd ordered to finish the job. While Imam Hussein was taking rest against the tree, Shimon knew that Imam Hussein was unable to fight, and sent one of his men to go and kill him. The man went and seeing Imam Hussein's eyes, he got extremely scared and ran back to his camp. When Shimon asked why he had not killed Imam Hussein, the man replied that looking into his eyes, he saw Prophet Muhammad. Angrily, Shimra sent another man. This one was so frightened, that he dropped his sword and ran back to his camp. This time when Lanti Shimra asked him why he had not killed him, he said he saw into his eyes and saw the angry look of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Shimra was angry, said that he would have to do it himself. And wearing his armor, he went to where Imam Hussein was. Using his iron boots he kicked Imam Hussein in the ribs. Imam Hussein fell to the ground, when Shimra disrespected, and sat on top of him. Just before his throat was about to be cut, Imam Hussein asked Shimra ibn Diljorshan, have you done your prayers today? And this shocked Shimra, because he did not expect anyone in the position of Hussein, to ask about such a question. Using a blunt knife. He rugged twelve times against Imam Hussein's throat. While his head was on the ground, Shimra removed his head from his body. Lanti Shimra ibn Diljorshan was saying, I swear by God that I am raising your head, while I know that you are grandson of the Messenger of Allah, and the best of the people by father and mother. When he raised head of Hussein ibn Ali on a spear, the Ibn Sa'd's men looted all the valuables, from Hussein's body. The army of Ibn Sa'd rushed to loot the tents. The daughters of Muhammad's family were expelled from the tents, unveiled and barefooted, while weeping and crying for their slain relatives. The army set all the tents on fire. The women were asking, By Allah, will you make us pass the sight of the murder of Hussein? And when they saw the martyrs and wailed, then so Kana bin Hussein, embraced her father's body until some people dragged her away. Omar ibn Sa'd called volunteering horsemen to trample Imam Hussein's body. Ten horsemen trampled his body such that his chest and back were ground. Traditionally, it is believed that Imam Hussein's body was martyred, but his nor, light, and I'm Imamat were passed on to his son Ali, who became Imam Ali Zain al-Abdin, Sahifa al-Sijadiyah is a collection of his supplications.